Well, hello. Welcome to this live stream on memorizing some tough foreign language vocabulary and phrases in a memory palace. Today's memory of choice is some Sanskrit from the Ribhu Gita, which uh, Gary Weber has collected in Evolving Beyond Thought. And uh, really, really excited by what's being learned by this book, from this book. And uh, there's some challenging lines here and there, like words like Haradaya, <laughs> which I found interesting to, to work with. So if you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. This is Anthony Mitivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. And I'm going to go through some, uh, some of these phrases that I'm memorizing in Sanskrit and talk about what to do and how it's getting done. And sometimes there are things that, are, that make your mind go, oh my goodness, that's just too difficult. And then you've got to just work with it. You've got to massage, massage it. And so things like Hridaya Grantir Irita may seem a little bit discouraging at first. And uh, even I fall prey to that from time to time. But when you break it down, then it's, it's much easier to work with. So basically, all these lines uh, are really beautiful and they are very challenging to me because they require imagery that I haven't really had to stretch so far with because of the nature of the Sanskrit. So it's really, really quite uh, strange to think about it. Jaideep's here. Thanks for saying hello, Jaideep. If you're joining us, let me know where you are in the world and say hello. Hit the thumbs up to let me know you're engaged and uh, if you have questions, pop them in anytime. But one of the reasons why this is particularly challenging is like Chittameva Maha Dosham uh, is the first one. And just something like Chit, you know, when you're looking for images, where are you gonna go with this? Where are you gonna go with this? Um, so I thought of Chet from the Hardy Boys. And it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, but it works. Dota's here. Hello, Dota, thanks for saying hello. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, if you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world. Jaideep is in Delhi. Excellent, in India, and a uh, great place for uh, Sanskrit. Do you know any Sanskrit? Let me know. Um, but, Dehe aham iti sankalpa. Dehe aham iti sankalpa. So, uh, I think of my friend Leslie Day, and she was in a band. Uh, what the heck were they called? <laughs> I'll have to think about what, what that band was called. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure even why that I can't think of the name of the band, but her name was Leslie Day. And uh, uh, it was a really, really great friendship that we had in high school. I always appreciated her. We studied together Literature 12. So all I need to do now is see her maybe doing something with hay and uh, punching the hay or something, like a big pile of hay. And that needs to be in a memory palace. So. Dehe uh, Ahem is the, was the next one. So I got to think of what that could be. Abraham somehow comes to mind. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, but that should do, Ahem. Um, and then it was, uh, uh, I haven't encoded it yet, but I'm just, this is one thing you should do. Try to get it from raw memory some from time to time without encoding but it was et so et i think it was et et is a movie right and there's a little alien extraterrestrial so that could be there so now we got to weave weave them together so leslie day hitting the hay with abraham and uh and et so now what does et have to do with this well maybe et is being born out of the hay so, Dehe Aham E.T. and then Sankalpa, I think was the one, yeah, Sankalpa. So that's like such a challenge, right? But I remember my mom had a friend named Sandy and Cal, Cal Rifkin, uh, for example. There's people named Cal, Cal L, I think, in the Superman world, um, and Pa. So Pa is like dad, right? So Sankalpa. Um, now, of course, we've got to have the meaning of all this, right? So, but first, I like to work with just sounds. I love to work with sounds. Um, let me check in with the chat here, though, very briefly, see what, what we've got here. So Dota says, what book is this? This book is called Evolving Beyond Thought by Gary Weber. 
and uh, it's going to show up mirrored because Apple and uh, Facebook are not talking to each other properly. But Evolving Beyond Thought, really great book by Gary Weber. And he includes the Ripu Gita or some selected passages from the Ripu Gita. And they're very challenging. It's some of the most challenging things that I've ever had to create magnetic imagery for. Uh, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to memorize. So thanks uh, for asking Dota. And... Rajan says, how to memorize physics. Rajan, give me an, a specific example and we'll go from there. Ibrahim is here from Libya. All right, thanks for saying hello. If you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world. Dota says, can you tell me about today's session? Well, we're going to go through some of these lines and break it down, try and figure out what some imagery would be. And uh, I was just going to do it by myself, but I thought I'd hop on a hangout and uh, let me know if that's a good idea. Uh, otherwise, you don't have to do this, these sorts of things, but hit the thumbs up, let me know you're engaged, and uh, let me know uh, if you have questions. I know that uh, Rajan has a question about how to memorize physics. Ultimately, what we do is we can't just say how to memorize physics. It's like saying how to memorize uh, a tree, you know, like what about the tree? Um, I remember that, uh, that uh, Erasmus or Ra Rasmus was here on our live streams, Rasmus, and he asked about trade, T R A umlaut D, which is Swedish for tree, I believe. Harvinder's here. Hello, Harvinder. Thanks for saying hello. Uh, great to see you as always. Um, let me know in the chat how you're doing. It's been not too long since we saw each other, but always good to see you again. Um, but yeah, we want to be working from specifics. So. Physics, what is this? Are we talking about acceleration, force, equations, whatnot? When I am working on language and so forth, what am I working on? Well, I'm working on uh, the actual uh, homophonic transliteration into English from the Sanskrit, which is different than any of the actual uh, characters there, uh, the alphabet and the actual words, but I'm also working on the meaning. So what I've been doing is I've been working on getting the sounds first and then the meaning of the of the phrase. That's working really, really great. Although I tend to know what the meaning of the phrase is already as I'm going, but I haven't necessarily directly encoded it. So, Dehe Aham, E.T., San Kelpa. So, I had some images for there. Now, the thing is, is that this is all in a memory palace that's unwinding, it's very near and dear to me. And now I, now I think I have some really, really good, strong images. So it was Leslie Day. Annoying that I can't think of the name of the band that she was in, but it'll come to me. Really great music. Um, but she was a good friend with a haystack giving birth to E.T., the extraterrestrial. And then uh, uh, Abraham, Aham. And then, well, now we got to make sure that Aham is connected with San Calpa. So Sandy was my mom's friend, Cal L maybe, or Cal Rifkin, and uh, my dad, right? Pa. So, really great. Shadeep says Sanskrit. Yes, absolutely. Thumbs up to Sanskrit. Really fascinating and amazing. And one of the reasons why I'm doing it is, as Gary Weber talks about, both in Happiness Beyond Thought and Evolving Beyond Thought, is that, uh, you know, working with self-inquiry questions is a great way of, I think... I don't know if he would use this word, but polishing the rough edges of the self and maybe even grinding out the ego uh, one chant at a time. <laughs> but it's important that the chants actually have some sort of meaning that your mind works with because when you, the one I'm working on now, where does the feeling of a knot in our heart come from? When you, when you meditate upon that, you know, you're, uh, you're really focusing on certain areas like you don't have to meditate on this one all the time, but if you ever have that feeling of yearning or longing, like the previous one, uh, or the one previous to this is, is where does bondage come from? And where does, uh, where does that sense of bondage come from? And so that's mana eva hi samsaram, mana eva hi mandalam, mana eva hi bandhadvam, mana eva hi patakam. And uh, is that right? Yeah, how, do bondage, how does bondage arise? And when you are in a moment of yearning or longing or incorrectly uh, somehow thinking wrong about the world and you just say like, where's this bondage coming from? And you're able to do it in two languages and really, really meditate on it and focus on it. 
it quickly changes all kinds of stuff. Oh, Jay Hayes here with Glossolalia. Jay Hayes says, good day, Anthony, good to see you. Good to see you, Jay Hayes, and Glossolalia. Well, yeah, well, this is not Glossolalia, because Glossolalia I can imitate off the top of the head. I grew up with that garbage. Some glossolalia for you. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's nonsense stuff that maybe people are having a benefit from it. Let's not be too critical and not, not get on the high horse. But uh, by the same token, there's a lot of damage coming from that nonsense, uh, for sure. And one of the reasons why is because it is not scientific. But what I love about this tradition here, this stuff, that Gary Weber has produced is it's from a scientific tradition. It's like the oldest science in the world. Often we think of Thales as from the Greek tradition as the first scientist and the first philosopher. But there are pretty obviously some dudes doing the science of the self long before this. Long, long, long before this. And they were doing it scientifically. Now what does this mean? And why does it matter? Well it matters because what is science? Science at the end of the day is a tool for producing evidence that confirms and validates and verifies the validity of claims. Some of those claims uh, may be, uh, you know, very, very real, very consequential, the kind of thing that leads to pills in bottles being consumed by millions of people. Others of those claims may be something as, do I really exist? <laughs> or is the ego that I perceived to be real actually as real and stable as I think it is. And thousands of years ago, these old Jehudis were hanging out in caves, sitting there designing these scientific experiments through language alone to ask these questions, to produce evidence in support of these questions that uh, are really like, where does this bondage I'm experiencing come from? And when you really meditate upon that, or where is the heart, you know? Where is the knot in the heart that I feel? And when you really investigate this, you can't really find it. You can't produce the evidence that supports the claim that it's there at all because thought is moving, it's shifting, it's all over the place. And so it's really, really powerful and I love it. And that's one of the reasons why I'm into it because it's very edifying, it's very uh, elucidating and it's very, shall we say, enlightening. Julie's here, hello from California. Julie, always good to see you. So glad that you're here. I don't have my Batman cup, it's over there, but you know, you know the one. <laughs> Uh, Jay says more of a witticism than a serious thing for sure. Yeah, like I said, I was on my high horse there a little bit Maybe I still have an ego. <laughs> Don't tell my ego though <laughs> But in any case, so um, Thanks everyone for being here hit that thumbs up if you're just joining us Let me know where you are in the world what you're doing what you're thinking and uh, if you have any questions and be specific physics So I think I saw a question here uh, That I didn't get Jaideep says is it it's the Gita or the Vedas? Um, well in this case the Ribhu Gita, I guess, is a Gita that belongs to the Vedas. Um, not entirely sure. I haven't dove in, d dived in, dove in strongly enough yet to really um, to really understand the whole thing about the Upanishads and and whatnot. But uh, really fascinating tradition. I know I'm drawn to it because it's scientific, which is very different than uh, Glossolalia. Although you never know, you never know. Dota asks, how to memorize something for the long term? Great question. So memory, we know, uh, is something that is mysterious, vast, strange, and yet it follows rules. And those rules are understandable and graspable and maybe even bendable, so long as you know the rules, because you can't bend what you don't know. And I was speaking with Nelson Dulles today, actually, about his new book, Remember It. It's not available yet, but you can get it on pre-order, and I highly recommend that you do, nelsondellis.com uh, forward slash remember dash it, if memory serves. Test me, <laughs> see if that works. But uh, it's a great, great book. And we were, you know, we were talking about these rules and how easy they are to perceive and how to work with them, how to, how to actually generate trust with your memory. And that's ultimately where you get to. You get to experience these weird mysteries where the wor rules seem to bend so long as you actually are following the rules. So some examples of that are like the speed at which some of the comp competitors develop to memorize cards and they will sometimes not even have time to encode the cards and they'll still get them. Uh, 
So they, there, there must be something going on that still follows the rules, but it's gotten so fast, it's like outside of perception. I've experienced this in my own way, like I memorize cards in front of my wife and so forth, and I'll just do my wonderful, you know, comfort zone stuff, and then uh, I'll glance at the last couple of cards, and I'll do my thing and show her what I did, and yeah, gratitude, or stroking the ego and all that stuff, and then uh, I'll say, you know what? Those last couple cards though, I didn't even encode them, but I, I'm gonna guess what they are. And like 98% of the time, it'll be correct, just by virtue of this. Now, long-term memory though, I mean, that's cool stuff that happens to you if you, were, you use the techniques sufficiently enough to develop that sort of skill. And you don't wanna rest on your laurels with that stuff, and that's not what you wanna do when push comes to shove. Uh, so another example of this guy, Thomas, that I met originally at a, a live event where I was teaching memory techniques. Then he showed up at my next live event where I was teaching memory techniques and I had this excruciating couple of minutes where I was like, what was that guy's name? And I just had to trust the memory techniques and I got it. And it was just great. It was a celebration like you wouldn't believe. Um, but the reason why that his name came and was in long-term memory is because of following the rules of repetition, but in a way that reduces the amount of repetition needed. So. As an example, walking into that room, there were a number of people. I memorized all their names. Then I made sure to revisit that room, which was now a memory palace, by virtue of them having been sat in individual places. And I can just go around mentally in my mind. And because I associated images with them, trigger off those images, and then uh, recall the name. And if you do that a sufficient number of times, it will stay in long-term memory even if you've forgotten it. And so months later, I don't know that it was exactly three months, but I run into the guy. Fate makes it so that even though I'm just like, gee, I don't even think I can remember that guy's name even though I should be able to. And then fate brings us together to enter the elevator at the exact same time. And then I was just like, just trust your memory, man. Thomas. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, wow, it works. Like I couldn't hide my own excitement. Uh, and I had to be a bit ballsy in that moment. But it worked because of actually committing it to long-term memory, not only through the initial encoding procedure, but after I left the event, I went through it a sufficient number of times. I don't actually recall how many times I went through it, but you tend to develop an instinct for what is sufficient. And never be too sure. That's the one rule that I would always suggest to you is never be too sure. Do one more extra. Um, and I must have done one more extra in that case, or at least I assume that I did, because it, it did come. And uh, that's how it works for anything. So if I close the cover of the book here, put it against my head, and I think, uh, see, I've, I haven't done it a sufficient number of times, but I'm going to work with it without cheating. That's one thing Nelson and I talked about today is that one of the biggest things and most important things is that you don't cheat, right? You've got to actually test it, even if you're going to look like a fool and get it wrong. So let me see if I look like a fool and get it wrong. But it was Dehe Ahem Et San Kalpa. So Dehe Ahem Et San Kalpa. Great. Now, I just need to do that again and again and again. Uh, until that it's bulletproof. And when I say again and again and again and again and again, I'm exaggerating. It probably needs to be around five to six times. Um, and also, one of the things that I love to do that really s shortens the amount of repetitions is to do things out of order. So if we look at the whole thing that, that I've memorized, the, the way that they're organized is uh, there's a line, and then a line, and then a line, and a line. So there's four. And so instead of going linearly all the time, there's something called the spatial positioning effect, and there's the recency effect and the primacy effect. And the spatial positioning effect, if you use it in memory palaces, lets you give primacy and recency to everything. Uh, so in this case, I just have the first line of the four lines. But what I would do, once I have all four, and what I will do, and what I've done with all of it, which is how I got what I've all memorized into memory so fast, is uh, I would skip. So I'd go from the first one to the third one to the second one to the fourth one, and then to the in the next sequence, the second one back to the first one, then to the fourth one to the third one, and do all these different patterns. 
you'll get it into long-term memory so fast that way because you're giving primacy and recency to everything and nothing can be nothing can be uh, uh, destroyed as easily by the the what's called the forgetting curve and the forgetting curve tends to affect most what bottoms out uh, or what is in the middle rather that's what bottoms out the most the middle stuff and so what you need to really really focus on in this in this work is that you're doing that sufficiently and it, you can do it in individual phrases you can do it with vocabulary arrangement and so forth the, the thing is is to do it and it, it the thing is it feels really good too and you challenge and you stretch and then you go into like really difficult stuff like I'm finding as I said before some of the Sanskrit is really really challenging partly because I, I don't you know it's my first encounter with some unusual sounds uh, but as Gary Weber said in a uh, a recent uh, video that he released, uh, you'll be familiar with a lot of these sounds because a lot of the roots of English are from Sanskrit, and of course that would be true of, of many Indian languages too. So irita is one of these words here, I think it is. Um, and irita, probably, because this says where does the feeling of a knot in our heart come from, irita is probably the root of the English irritation, right? So now, when you, when you think that way too, this is another memory tool, you have a hook, you have a connection, you have something to build upon. So that's kind of cool and fun to think about. Let's catch up with our chats here. JA says, rules as an acronym for really understand long enduring energy and speed. Yeah, that's awesome. Long enduring energy and speed. To really understand long enduring energy and speed. I love that. That's great. Everybody, thumbs up for JA and that acronym. Awesome. Jadeep says, I'm going to be enrolled uh, for Phenomenal. Is it a good course? I, I personally have not heard great things about it. Uh, in fact, well, <laughs> let's leave it at that. <laughs> There's a thing called Caveat Emptor, buyer beware. I suggest you uh, use it. Uh, Jay says, whatever you put into something, you get out with interest, Jaideep. It's like banking. Yeah, it is, but again, buyer beware. Uh, what is dissimilarity between memory palace and room system? Is it the same or not? Ask Dota. Yeah, that's another thing that Nelson and I were talking about. Uh, well, look, all memory, I think, ultimately is location-based. And the reason why is because your memory is encoded into your brain cells. And we know from some of the best memory science, Stephen Costlin's The Case for Mental Imagery is to, uh, to the book to read on this, or one of them anyway, but it's a great one that I highly recommend. Um, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful, amazing way of understanding the chemical locations of how memory is encoded and just how general memory general information is processed so you want to to think about how that your brain is a spatial element and how that all information is spatial one way or the other it's very simple every word falls in a sequence beside other words left or right up down whatever where however the language is written and then it's going to be written into your mind chemically encoded in your mind and even though the chemicals in which information is stored move and change place over time, the reality is, is that when you are involving mnemonics, you're helping craft and shape the consolidation of those chemicals in the places that they will be by virtue of creating more neural connections, neural network connections. So the more you use magnetic imagery, the more it's going to bind together and the easier you'll be able to recall it and the faster you'll get with these skills. So really, really important to, to do this and to, to, to think about some of that nature of memory as spatial from the get-go. And so Thales, I mentioned earlier today already, he said, uh, what was it, Megaston Topos Hapanthagar Kori which means space is ultimate because it contains all things. And then when we look at Simonides of Kos and the story of the banquet hall that, the, that is the beginning of the memory tradition, well, what is it? It's, it's, it's showing that in his mind, everything that happened at that banquet, all the names of the people, 
was arranged spatially within the banquet, but also in his mind, in his mind. So that's really, really important. Boya is here from Tokyo. Hello, Boya. Great to see you here. Uh, Shubham asks, are there any recommendations for improving memory? Book recommendations. Yeah, um, for sure. There's many, many, many. What ways, what specific ways do you want to improve your memory? Andy's here. Hello, Andy. Great to see you. It's been a while. Andy asks, what are the differences between the different kinds of memory? I've heard you mention semantic and a few others. Okay, so that's a great question, Andy. It's a very useful one. Um, so there's lots of different kinds of memory, but for our purposes, one of the things that we're doing with the memory palace is we're unlocking spatial memory. And spatial memory is sometimes called spatial mapping or it's related to spatial mapping. And it's just generally the ability to, to um, remember space, remember buildings, remember the layouts of buildings. And it may be involved in some things like the spacing, like where in a book a piece of information is. Like, where's halfway through the book? Things like that. Uh, and then autobiographical memory is memory about your life that's related to your life, the stories, the people that were involved, although that can bleed into other forms of memory. But generally, it's just the stuff related to your story and the things you know about you that can have experiment, experiential elements and can have uh, elements related to perhaps um, sensations, feelings, like the, maybe you remember the temperature of the swimming pool when you were a kid and like that, which is both location and age, information about your age, information about feelings, kinesthetic information and so forth. So autobiographical memory touches many, all these memories touch each other in multiple ways. Uh, then there's uh, semantic memory, which tends to be about facts and stuff along this, these lines. And that's where a lot of abstract information lies uh, that can sometimes be very challenging. And then there's episodic memory. And episodic memory, well, how does that differ than autobiographical memory? Because it's episodes, like stories and, and sequences. And it's also very, tends to be very image bound, as if you could roll back a, a movie and see that uh, in some detail through your mind. So uh, one of the interesting things you can do is practice telling back the stories of movies that you've seen to work on developing your episodic memory. Usually you'll find that you have a very good recall of the way movies end and the way they begin, but the middle will drop out. And we've all had this experience where someone's like telling us about a movie and then all of a sudden they'll be talking about the middle parts and then they'll say, wait, 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 I missed a detail. And then they'll go back and then they'll go, oh, but then I missed this other detail. And the whole middle part is just a mess. But they'll remember, and you'll remember how the middle or the beginning and the end worked. And that, that relates a lot to what we were already previously talking about, which is uh, uh, the primacy effect and the recency effect and the, the forgetting curve. And so serial positioning is, the, is one of the ways that we, we, we overcome that. Um, other levels of memory beyond that, well, there's procedural memory and um, uh, declarative memory. There's lots and lots of different levels of memory, but pr procedural is probably with the, the end of where, where we really need to focus. And luckily, the magnetic memory method does all the work for you. So when you're using the memory palaces as we teach and directing them at large goals like language learning and so forth, what you're doing is unlocking spatial memory in a way that unlocks autobiographical memory, in a way that unlocks episodic memory, in a way that unlocks semantic memory, in a way that unlocks procedural memory. And uh, declarative memory is in there, but it's not the core focus. So let me know if you have more questions around that. I think that at the end of the day, it's very, very good to to educate oneself about memory science and what we know about these different levels of memory, but you also need to take them with a grain of salt. And the reason why is because they touch upon each other. They're interacting and interrelated and it's just terminology. It's human constructions that have been labeled or labels that have been placed upon phenomena in the world. And this comes back to the question of what science is. Well, the validity of any of these terms has to do with the amount of evidence that we've produced in order to validate 
the use of these or this or that term. So I think these are all very, very good terms, and they seem to have stood the test of time. But at the same time, we wouldn't want to think, oh my goodness, I really have to focus on my uh, procedural memory, right? Well, maybe that would give you an advantage, but the reality is to have a nice wholeness and a, a nice roundedness of all your memories, and you can practice them and work on them all at once. There's no problem with that. Uh, if you direct it at a large learning goal and you learn the techniques that will help you create that outcome for yourself, and uh, you find good teachers that are in line with your vision for the world. So I hope that uh, helps you out, Andy. Dota asks, why do ordinary images, why don't ordinary images come to mind? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by ordinary images. Let me know with some more detail. Uh, Shupam says, books that might help me boost my learning skills related to college stuff. Well, um, the memory connection will help you with that, but it's currently not on the market. You could uh, look up, uh, well, Remember It from Nelson Dulles is coming out here real soon. And, uh, you know, just the, just the classics, uh, the memory book from Buzan, Harry Lorraine. I just, the caution with these things is that if you're looking for school material um, for college, then the only guy I know who has a PhD who used memory techniques to do it is myself. Uh, the memory connection is not available at the moment, but it will be uh, in the near future again. But there's also the master class in the meantime, which has a course called the master plan. And the master plan will set you up for college for good. Abdullah says, uh, how do I cram the, GCS, the GCSE course in nine months using memory files? Well, you don't cram. We don't talk about cramming. We don't recommend it. And so if you want to rephrase the question, uh, then we can work on that. But there's no cramming involved in what we do. Uh, Dota says, I mean simple images like unknown people, faces, and so on. Um, great. Uh, well, I'm not sure if you were talking about faces, then that imagery is in your mind just by looking at the names of the people and their faces. So please be a little more specific. Um, Stormy Cape says, Anthony, talk about your best procedure when memorizing a foreign language. Vocabulary first, grammar second, etc. So, great question, Stormy Cape. Uh, the procedure is very, very simple. What is it that I want to do in the language? So, take Chinese, for example. I was going to go to China. I had three months, to less than three months to prepare. I wanted to be able to have small talk, everyday conversation, and I wanted to be able to uh, order things at restaurants. I want to be able to ask directions, particularly for particular destinations. I knew what those destinations are because I'm a human. So restaurants, hotels, bathrooms, uh, things of that nature. I wanted to be able to have a bit of small talk with uh, with uh, my future father-in-law. So, did, you know, do you do you like the news? That kind of stuff. Um, newspapers. I figured he was probably a newspaper reading kind of guy. Uh, and so those are missions, mission-oriented learning. Now, the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass comes with the Magnetic Memory Method Vocabulary Builder. So I just followed that, which is designed to be able to help you have all those things. Um, so really, I focus on the core vocabulary. Then I add phrases to the core vocabulary. I do not ever worry about grammar because I'm learning how to speak a language, not assess it mathematically. Um, grammar rules are picked up along the way. You'll observe them naturally if you're working on vocabulary and phrases. If you're especially interested, then by all means, uh, learn the grammar. But you, ultimately, what you end up doing is focusing on the grammar of your mother tongue and then reverse engineering it to how it works on the language itself, when really you can just pick it up uh, as you go along. So I wouldn't uh, ever make grammar a part of my life or my study project or memorizing its rules unless there was some real pressing need to do so but you'll just pick it up naturally uh, along the way um, now it does help if you have a language that has a lot of irregular verbs and regular verbs to know what those are and then stack them like rack them and stack them so you have a number of examples so if it's past or present or future or whatever the case may be or, or number number differences that you might have to account for 
rack and stack a bunch of examples so that you build an intuitive sense. And that intuitive sense will help you along the way a great deal. But grammar is the least of the things I would ever focus on or recommend anybody focusing on unless you're a grammarian or a fan of grammar and it doesn't become a barrier. So to sum up, have missions. Make sure you have a source of vocabulary that is rich in potential for phrases that you're actually going to use based on specific missions where you know there are certain things that you want to accomplish and uh, go from there and do that again and again and again. And that's going to be very, very helpful. Oh, and have speaking partners uh, because you need to follow the big five, right? So read, write, speak, listen in ways that serve memory and then uh, speak, read, write, and listen out of your memory and then it's a perfect circle. Uh, so Stormy Cape says, I will apply to Latin. Yeah, well, Latin, exactly. You might think that you have the listening and the speaking cut out of the equation when it's a dead language, but that's not true. You can find recordings of people speaking in Latin. You can find clubs where people speak Latin. You can uh, speak Latin to yourself in the shower. And, you know, every time you're speaking, you're also hearing. Uh, but you want to, you know, you want to consume as much as you can. So, yeah, no languages. I mean, look, I don't have anybody to speak Sanskrit with. I'm not technically learning Sanskrit, but rather Sanskrit phrases. But there's all kinds of internet stuff filled with spoken Sanskrit uh, that you can go and listen to, and you can record yourself. Or I do this in the shower all the time. Really, uh, really great and fulfilling. So, Dota asks, how to memorize newspapers by using the memory technique? Which memory technique is useful for memorizing magazines? So do you mean... Do you mean uh, memorizing it line by line, verbatim, or just the major facts? I would never memorize a newspaper or uh, anything like that word for word, but unless there was some extraordinary reason to do so. I can't imagine ever having an extraordinary reason to do that, but uh, if it was, uh, then maybe. And the way that I would do that is to create the memory palaces that would support that. But if it was just facts from the newspaper, then I would use, well, the memory palace. Um, but we don't focus on things that have no purpose. There's a video on, uh, on this channel about the Memorize a Book Dare. And uh, so many people want to memorize books verbatim when they don't technically need to. Uh, you, this goes back to Andy's great question about the different kinds of memory. And you want to think about like the different kinds of memory goals that you can accomplish and what those settings, what you would need to do with them. So um, basically uh, what you want to do is you want to think what is the real purpose here? What's the real goal? And then use the systems that support that. At the end of the day I will always recommend going to the memory palace. I can't think of how else to support volumes of information without memory palaces and a sufficient number of them. Again, Nelson and I had a great chat about that today. I can't wait to release the interview where we're talking about the importance of multiple memory palaces and really how it leads to greater fulfillment in life. And I was really excited that he, in the new book, Remember It, also talks about the importance of multiple memory palaces. And it, I just can't stress it enough. It's not, it's, it's, it's just these large projects that that some people feel they need to do verbatim, whether I'm right or wrong, that they actually need that. Uh, there's just there's just no way without without massive uh, concentration on having a sufficient number of memory palaces and being good with the memory palace technique. I can't. I personally can't think of any other way. If there is, then I'm very excited to know what that way is. But I I doubt that there is such a way. Uh, and I don't even look. Even if there was such a way. I can't even envision it being pleasurable. Um, that's just very hard for me to imagine. <laughs> so uh, make sure that you are well familiar with the memory palace technique. And if you go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT, we have the course there and the worksheets that will help you get through it. Uh, and, and make sure that you hit the ground running with a sufficient number of techniques. And it was cool too reading Nelson's new book and speaking with him today my thoughts about how pegs and links and memory palaces are all so much more closely related than, uh, than we think and then his thoughts about that in return. It's going to be a cool interview for you to listen to and think and come up with your own conclusions. Come up with your own things. I mean, there's a, 
there's so much to explore and discover and to to work with but at the same time you want to explore the rules first before you try to break any of them and so that's why we do the things that we do as uh, helping educate people and it was great to speak with him because uh, he's so good and really well educated in these areas so thanks everybody that was a great session really appreciated everybody showing up here let me test my memory here uh, so it was Leslie Day basically punching a haystack and E.T. was coming out of it Abraham was there and then Sandy Cal L and my dad so uh, Dehe Ahem e, Ahem E.T. oh yeah E.T. See, I didn't even remember it in the actual images, but once you start to decode it on a word-by-word -word basis. So, Dehe Ahem E.T. San Kalpa. Let's see here. Dehe Ahem E.T. San Kalpa. Sweet. Bit challenging, though. Bit challenging, I must admit. Uh, fun. And I'm glad I was able to uh, share that experience with all of you. So, let's see, Dota says, I watched a video of Darren Brown. He saw a book, uh, about 20 minutes, memorized book. Yeah, Darren Brown is a, is a great, great mentalist and performer. Take it with a grain of salt. Um, Andy, I'm really sorry. I pressed a wrong button and somehow have made your message disappear. I apologize about that. If you can make it come back somehow, I don't know. Um, I wish that I didn't press that button wrong. Many apologies. I hope that you'll be able to type it again. Uh, Tyler says, this technique is awesome. Keep teaching, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Tyler, for the kind words. I appreciate it. Julie says, in Lydia Markova's language, oh, Lydia is great. Language Mentoring Academy. I realized how important it is to have maximum input of your target language via radio, podcasts, um, TV, YouTube, books on tape, etc. Yeah, it's really, really important um, to have all of that, all of that input. Um, super important. So, I'm not really able to uh, to operate this very well. <laughs> I'm sorry, Andy. I really wanted to read your comment there. I'm not sure how that I pressed the wrong button and I do not see a way to get it back. So... I'm gonna actually see if that did anything. No, it didn't. This is the boring part of the show, guys. Sorry about this. In any case, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hope that uh, we get to. Oh, Andy says no worries. I posted that my brain feels like it's been working out since I started your master class. I feel more aware in a way. Oh, that's so great, Andy. Thank you for um, for reposting. <laughs> that puts my mind at ease. I I always worry about these these things. Uh, they're very big to me. I appreciate it very much. Um, and I'm glad you're feeling more aware. That ultimately is one of the biggest outcomes and goals for all people is to have this opening of being present to the world and being able to receive information differently than you ever would have before and hold on to it because you're aware of it, you're aware of the potential and you're able to grasp it, work with it, massage it, use it in real life, everyday applications that actually improve your life. And that's what we're going for. And so that's what it's all about. And I wanna thank you all for the really great questions uh, if you join us again and your question wasn't answered in quite the way that you'd like, I would recommend great specificity, like saying, hey, how do I memorize physics? Can't really deal with that because there's so much going on in physics. But if you are more specific and so forth, then that's great. And of course, all of this makes much more sense if you at least start with the free course at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT and generally get yourself educated about memory and uh, and I really appreciate Andy's questions about the different levels of memory. I hope that that, that uh, speech uh, helped. And if you um, have more questions around that, by all means, I mean, there's great memory science out there. It'll serve you well. And I appreciate all interest in it. 
But also, please don't get hung up on memory science if it's not interesting to you because you don't need to know how, uh, how an, a car engine operates in order to drive yourself very happily from one end of town to the other. And uh, obviously your experience of driving that car is very different if you do know how your car operates, but um, you've got to really hedge your bets and spend your time on the things that matter and you don't necessarily need to know all the mechanics of memory science in order to get huge amounts of results from your memory. And I certainly didn't get into memory science until way after I was getting great results. So. Julie says, always happy and motivating to catch you online like now. Thank you, Julie. Thumbs up to Julie. Really great always to see you, as well as Andy and Harvinder and everyone who's here. Dota, thank you. Uh, basically, it's always good to see a mix of existing Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass uh, participants, and I learn as much from you as, uh, as I hope you learn from me, and I hope to continue the learning. Dota says, love your explaining, sir. You are great. You are great as well, Dota. Thank you for being here. And listen, till we have a chance to speak again tomorrow, we're releasing the new podcast. It's about Mind Map Mastery by Tony Buzan. Go and visit MagneticMemoryMethod.com about this time tomorrow. It'll be there for you, and I hope you're going to enjoy it. Then we've got the interview coming up, probably be the 27th of September, with uh, uh, Nelson Dulles about Remember It. And it's not a book review interview. We're going deep into what he talks about there. So you're going to want to hear it, because uh, we really... I really make sure to uh, ask him the, for the, the real deal, you know? And so you're going to love that. And uh, also, Phil Chambers' book will be coming in between, which is a podcast all about that, how to train your memory. Excellent book. So it's September, sort of subtle, back-to-school uh, books that you can read. So those were other suggestions. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, the first question is to really think about what's my goal and what teacher is going to help me the best. So, really appreciate it. Ahmed has a great question about how to improve English. I would say start with vocabulary, then memorize phrases, and then have real goals so that you're memorizing the vocabulary that helps you fulfill those goals and memorizing the phrases that help you fulfill those goals. But I got it yet. Really great seeing everybody. Till we have a chance to speak again, keep your eye out for the next live stream. Hit the thumbs up, come back, leave a comment later if you like and uh, come visit me tomorrow at magneticmerrymethod.com for the new Mind Map Mastery Exposé, the 10 rules that Tony Buzan has for mind mapping, all on tap on the blog post if you prefer reading and the episode. So if you like to listen, that's there for you too. And Julie says, maximum input, important for your, from your sessions as well. It keeps me going, excellent. We are all about maximum output. <laughs> and. Uh, Dota says he wants to become a politician. Excellent. I hope you become a good one because we need as many good ones as we can get. Thanks again, everybody. Until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.